Welcome to this webinar, Supporting Your Students' College Search, A Parent's Guide to the College Admissions Process. My name is Caitlin. I'm an Associate Director of Admission at Denison University. And this is my colleague, Becca Larson, who's the Regional Director of Admission at Muhlenberg College. I'll let her talk about Muhlenberg in a moment. Um, we are going to be speaking for between 45 and 60 minutes. Again, want to be sensitive of your time. We have a little presentation first, just a couple of slides with some advice, and then we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions and answers. So if you have questions and answers throughout this, feel free to use the Q&A feature. That's the best one. Um, and we will be both responding in real time if we can, as well as just covering those at the end. We're super glad to have you here, and I'm gonna let Becca take a little bit of time to tell you just a little bit about Muhlenberg. Awesome. Thanks so much for that intro, Caitlin. Hi, good evening, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. Caitlin and I are both based in Southern California, so it's the late afternoon for us. Um, so I just want to spend about a minute or so before we dive into the program sharing a bit about Muhlenberg with you, if you're not familiar. We are a small liberal arts college located in Allentown, Pennsylvania. We're about 60 miles from Philadelphia, 90 miles from New York City. Um, there are three different airports that you can fly into to get to campus, so it's pretty easy, um, you, you know, no matter where you're coming from to get to Muhlenberg. Allentown is the third largest city in Pennsylvania. Um, it has a population of about 250,000 and healthcare is the largest industry within the Lehigh Valley where we're situated. So Muhlenberg is a great place for students who are interested in pursuing careers in healthcare. We have partnerships with um, two different hospitals for both clinical and research opportunities for our students. At the college, we offer just under 40 different majors. We're known for our strength in the visual and performing arts. We have an incredible theater program with a concentration in musical theater. Um, we also have a great dance program and students are eligible to participate in our productions and performances, um, even if they're a non-major. So if you are someone who's passionate about theater but wants to study neuroscience or public health, you can still um, audition for the musical for all the different plays that we're doing. So there's lots of ways to get involved artistically at the college. Um, we are a Division Three school. Our football team ranked fourth, or we placed fourth last year in a Division Three championships. So that was an exciting time for us. And then one other quick fun fact that I'll share with you before I pass things off to Caitlin um, is that we've been consistently ranked as some of the top college food in the nation. So lots of really yummy things to eat um, at Muhlenberg. Our baked goods are spectacular. The whoopie pies in particular are some of my favorite. Um, as I've spoken with our students who are um, you know, back home for the summer and I ask the things that they miss most about Muhlenberg, food is almost one of the number one things that they say. Um, so that is a big point of pride for us. And something important to consider when you're thinking about where your child will go is will they be well nourished and so I can confidently say at Muhlenberg that our students are, are well fed um, and enjoy the the community that comes along with our dining commons as well so of course there's lots more to share if you have questions about Muhlenberg or you have a child or student who is interested please don't hesitate to put them in touch with me thanks yeah I didn't know that about the food um so I work for Denison as um, I said before, we are a small liberal arts college in Granville, Ohio. So you can see on the map, um, we're about 40 or so minutes from Columbus. So our students have a great balance of small town living in the um, village of Granville, which is pretty, it's a lot more New Englandy than a lot of people, at least here on the West Coast, think about the Midwest, I think. Um, and so small town with access to a big city is something that attracts a lot of our students at Denison. Um, we are very, I mean, similar in a lot of ways in terms of liberal arts to Muhlenberg. Locations obviously different, but we are a highly relational college. Um, that is something that the president loves to talk about. So the relationship among and between faculty, staff, and students, this is the kind of school where the president used to be walking around all the time and, um, you know, students know him, he knows students. Um, this is a school where students, when COVID happened, for example, moved in with families in Granville um, when they couldn't get home. So this is a place where people really do take care of each other. We have some interesting um, new majors coming. So global health, which is actually not at all related to the fact that COVID happened, um, a new political science major, as well as some other more kind of pragmatic uh, approaches to the liberal arts. So that's something that we're really proud of. We are also division three in athletics and have 
some very strong athletic programs. So this is a pretty spirited school, especially in terms of a Division three program. Um, and we also have uh, a pretty strong theater program. Neil and Bernie and Dennison are sounding similar <laughs> right now, um, but we have a brand new performing arts center, which we're really proud of and really excited about. Um, yeah, so if you are interested in learning more about Dennison, both of our contact information will be at the end of this. Um, we are gonna go ahead and get started on the meat of this presentation. So go ahead, Becca. Awesome. So before we really dive in, we just want to give you an overview of some of the, the points that we're going to discuss today, knowing that, um, you know, I want to preface this by saying, you know, the college process is a stressful process every single year for, for any student um, on, a, on a good year where things are happening normally and access to standardized testing is readily available. Um, and so first, we just want to say that we absolutely recognize um, the, the additional hurdles and challenges that you and your students are facing as you navigate this process. And we'll have some time later on in the presentation to talk about that. But tonight, we're going to go through a general timeline of kind of, um, you know, what you need to, to do to prepare for your child application process um, you know and really talking about um, the important family conversations that need to happen right those expectations and, and kind of ground rules that you want to set early on in the process we'll talk about the ways you want to get to know those schools um, how you want to do that research especially thinking about how you can do so in a virtual space knowing that you know travel is much more limited and whereas you know the idea of just doing a quick overnight visit and driving to a college and staying in a hotel was something we probably didn't think twice about now is something that you know we're very much thinking about and also knowing that many schools aren't open to visitors so really how you can get to know those schools how your child can and how you can um, and then we'll talk about the application um, you know, preparing that application and then also how to process the, the decision process, right? How to have those conversations about, um, you know, scholarships and financial aid and really make the decision that's best, of course, for your child, but also for you as a family in many different um, respects. And then we'll have lots of time for Q&A as well. So that's just another reminder to pop any questions that you have into the Q&A box and we will get to them um, throughout the presentation and, and certainly towards the very end. Yeah, and I think one more thing before we really get into the meat of this is that we are super happy that you're here because if you're here, that means you're interested in learning how to really successfully help your child um, navigate this process because there are all different kinds of ways to do it. And um, we're both admission professionals. Becca also was a high school counselor. So some of this is from her knowledge of that. Um, just some advice. Uh, based on our experiences in a multitude of different arenas. <laughs> so at first, the first thing we thought, um, because we know that there's a wide variety of people here, some students or some parents, you might have had students already go through this process. Others, this may be your first child, um, or maybe your student is not going to be a senior still and you're just kind of getting prepped. That's great. So this is really a general timeline of what the admission cycle looks like. So there are four different rounds of admission deadlines um, and they're outlined here. So not every school has all of these. I'll kind of talk about that at the end, but early action, basically you can think about that as your child submits his or her application, typically between like November 1 and November 30th, lots of different variety within that. And you're gonna get an early indication of the child's admission decision. Early action is not binding, so it's just if you can get the application in early, great. Um, some schools, the admission rate changes from early action to other rounds as well. A lot of times families ask, well, why wouldn't my kid just apply early action to every school possible? Great question. Maybe because the schools each have 10 different supplements and there's just not enough time to get all of the applications done. But early action, you'll get an early, you'll get an early release of their admission decision. Um, and yeah, you submit it a little bit earlier. Early decision, similar timeline, but that's a binding agreement. So if your child applies early decision to, for example, Denison, if he or she is admitted, they are coming to Denison. So early decision is not a decision to be taken lightly. Um, finances are a big part of many families' early decision decision. Um, sometimes coaches push athletes into this because they want to have their team locked up. So you will likely also hear probably within about a month of your 
application being submitted. And again, that's a binding agreement. There's also early decision two, which tends to be a little bit later, maybe January, another binding round. Um, why would you apply early decision or why would your student apply early decision? Again, this a school is their first choice. Um, maybe a coach is pushing them um, or um, yeah, I mean, you wanna just lock and get everything done, but it's not for everyone. So that's important to know. Rolling admission is really a, it's up in the air. Some schools will start accepting applications for rolling as soon as next month and go through January. Um, that's just, they're going to make decisions on a rolling basis. Um, it's not a binding agreement typically, but you might just be able to hear a little bit earlier. A lot of the time, larger schools do rolling decision. I know neither of us do that. Um, and then regular decision is really your like quote traditional admission probably timeline. So applications tend to be due in mid mid to late uh, December to mid to late January, um, and that's when your child will hear back around in March sometime um, by April first typically. Um, and yeah, so that's a little bit you know we thought it was important to give you the big picture timeline as you kind of think about a number of these other processes. There, it's really important as you create your list and kind of, and by you, I mean your child, um, as, as he or she creates kind of their list and their timeline, that they understand, again, that not every school has all of these rounds. So some schools have a combination, some schools only do rolling, so it's a great way you can find it on on the website or ask um, you know Becca or my counterparts at your institution. So those are just again a big timeline. So can I can I add something yep. real quick, Caitlin? Absolutely. Um, so you know I at this point there's a lot of changes happening in you know the admission process as we are all kind of adjusting to this new normal with um, with COVID. And, you know, I think in, in years past, the earlier deadlines, early action and early decision, students at that point had had the opportunity to visit campus to really get that experience yeah. and say, okay, I feel ready to apply. And so I can't predict the future. I don't know what our counterparts at other schools will do. I don't even know what we'll do at Muhlenberg, but I, I do have a feeling that schools might be shifting deadlines in different ways or that maybe, you know, early decision two will be the more popular option this yeah. year because it'll give students a little bit more time to do, um, you know, their, their preparation to see campus, to really engage with campus. Um, you know, it's tough to make a college decision, especially that binding agreement if you haven't physically been on campus. So again, I can't predict the future, but um, as we see these kind of rapid shifts happening with, you know, schools going test optional and things like that, it might be that the next wave of changes will be deadline um, extensions. So again, not sure, but I have a feeling. This, the <laughs> former slide was really just the traditional timeline. Exactly. Becca's yeah. so right. No idea. <laughs> um, but yeah, all right, Becca, take it away. <laughs> awesome. So, you know, I think, you know, whether you are, um, you know, the parent of a rising junior or a rising senior, it's important to create some some kind of family expectations and think about what those those wants and needs for a college student might be. Um, you know, I grew up, um, I'm from the East Coast originally, I'm the youngest of three, and my parents set some kind of parameters for us, right? You know, they, I, I grew up in a really close-knit family, all my aunts and uncles, grandma, we all lived like within, you know, minutes from one another. So the idea, and now I live in California, my poor parents, right? But, um, you know, when I was, you know, thinking about where I wanted to go to school and how I wanted to navigate that process, um, you know, we kind of created a, a radius, right? And we said, okay, I think what we'd all be most comfortable with is, you know, if you were driving driving distance away, you don't have to stay. I grew up in New Jersey. They didn't say you have to stay in New Jersey. Um, but, you know, we said, okay, maybe four or five hours is kind of the greatest distance that we want to go. And at that point in time, I'd been to sleepaway camp maybe once. I was like, okay, you know what, that feels like a safe distance, right? So maybe you create um, you know, that, that kind of boundary of, okay, let's, let's choose within driving distance. Or if your child is getting on an airplane, as many college students do now, right? Um, you know, some families say, okay, we want, we have a direct flight rule, right? So you can go somewhere on the East Coast or in the Midwest, but we have to get there by a direct flight because that's going to be the most convenient for us. It's going to be the easiest for you to get to campus, for us to visit you. Um, 
so you want to think about what those geographic expectations are. If your child has grown up in Southern California and they want to go to the East Coast or they want to go to Chicago for college, you might want to have a conversation about how do you feel about four seasons, right? How do you feel about navigating a really rough winter? Um, how might that change your college experience? Lots of the California students I work with, I'm sure Caitlin could say the same, are excited about schools um, in a different climate because they want to experience something new, right? But you don't want to have your child applying to colleges that you don't feel you know, comfortable with them going that, that far away from home. And I think especially with everything happening globally right now that there are you know, shifts in conversations that families are having in terms of what they feel comfortable with. Um, so have that geography conversation first and foremost, right? Make sure that everyone is on the same page. And even if your child maybe has different ideas, try to, you know, reach a common ground, right? Maybe it's, you know, I don't feel comfortable with you going overseas or all the way to, um, you know, the East Coast, but maybe the, the Midwest or, you know, kind of meeting in the middle kind of a thing. Um, you also want to have a conversation about finances, right? What is your expectation in terms of the loans, um, you know, that you feel comfortable taking out as a, as, a, as a parent, as a family unit, and what the expectation is for the child? Um, you know, have you saved money to go towards that college education? And so how will that be applied, right? You want to be transparent as much as you can and set that expectation early on because I think you know there's nothing worse than a student being admitted to a place and then realizing that it's it's not within reach financially right so so kind of create that that expectation of this is the amount of debt we're willing to incur you know as a family what we you know think is we feel comfortable with for you um, you know or if you have you know saved and you feel great about a college fund, you know, who's paying for books, right? There's all these other expenses that go into the college process. So it's not just, you know, tuition and room and board, but it's airfare or a, a train ticket or, you know, the cost of textbooks and, you know, furnishing your dorm and all of those things. So, so start, you know, setting those expectations early. Um, as a student is deciding, you know, on what schools are on their list, make sure they're offering the majors that your student is interested in, or if they're undecided, make sure that it's a place that's really going to support your student in, in making a decision. Um, you might have a really clear idea of what your child wants to study. They might have a really clear idea. Know that students change their minds all the time. Um, I changed my major several times. Caitlin, did you change your major or were you straight through? I did, I just didn't declare until like the last possible minute. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't you, you took it, some I time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it's, you know, students change their minds. They discover things that they didn't even know existed when they were in high school, right? I have conversations. Well, now public health is so much at the forefront of, of many conversations. But, you know, when I talk to our public health students at Muhlenberg, they're often like, I didn't even know public health was a thing before I, you know, got to Muhlenberg and started taking classes in it. So um, just, you know, setting that expectation of, you know, does this school have what I'm interested in studying? Um, and if it doesn't, how is it supporting students who are, you know, undecided and unsure of what it is they want to, to really focus on academically. Um, size is a big factor, right? Caitlin and I both work at small institutions that are very community oriented. You know, a, a large percentage of students live on campus all four years. Um, you know, think about how you know your child learns best. Are they someone who is independent and self-sufficient enough to navigate being at a bigger place that, you know, might, where they might be one of hundreds of students in a lecture hall versus in a small discussion-based class? Um, so set that, you know, that expectation, have those conversations. And then, you know, think about that residential experience as well, right? If your child is considering schools that are close to home, are you setting an expectation that they'll live at home and, you know, commute to school? Or do you really want them to have that residential experience of living away from home? For me, I ended up attending a college that was about two and a half hours um, from my, my home. It was like that perfect sweet spot where it was close enough that my family could get to me or I could get to them, but not so close that like my mom was popping in on Sunday nights to take me out to dinner or anything like that, right? So, so think about kind of what, what that comfort level is and what that expectation is as a family, um, you know, and, and try to create those expectations early on in the process. So there's no surprises that, um, you know, that catch you or your child off guard um, you know, once, once the decisions are, are rolling in in late March, early April. Yeah, and I think just before we advance the slide, what I would add is, you know, these are just factors to think about. We're not saying one of these is the most important, the least important, just kind of conversation starters. So I'm a firm believer, and I know that Becca believes this too, in none of these 
you know, finances, have those great, have those important conversations, but also it's okay to not limit where you apply based on what you think college might cost. Um, the cost of applying to college can be quite hefty. That is definitely a conversation to have, but you never know what a need-based or merit-based package will be. So, you know, have the conversation, but sometimes there are students whose, whose dream is to go to whichever school. And I think it's okay if you're comfortable with it to allow them to apply with them understanding that whether or not they can go depends one, if they get in and two, if the finances really pull through. Right, and I think that um, same, same with majors, right? Just because it doesn't have exactly the major, if your student is kind of undecided, it's, it's okay. There are a lot of schools, especially schools like our size, where students can create their own majors. Um, and you just never know what the priority will be um, in you know six months after you submit an application. I did not think I wanted to go to school close to home. I went to school 30 minutes away from my house because it ended up being the place that I loved the most. Um, so just, you know, things to think about. And I think good conversation starters, also especially in, in creating the list. So, you know, you've, you've kind of talked about where schools or what, what kinds of schools might work. Now you need to kind of get to know them before you can create a list. And this is actually where maybe COVID has made this a little bit easier in ways because you don't have to travel to really take advantage, I think, of some really great opportunities. So in a pre-COVID world, or you know, maybe once, depending on how old your students are, um, touring of colleges. Uh, there are some colleges that are open for tours, depending on where you live. You know, here in California, I don't think that's the case, but I know in other states that is. Um, or virtual tours. So I think that's a really great way uh, to kind of just get to know and see what would life be like for your student at this college. Um, I think it's important to listen to the buildings and the history and things like that. But if you can, if you go on a college tour, I really think it's important to kind of watch the interactions of the students around you and watch the interaction of the tour guide that you have with the students around you. Because a place where like the tour guide knows everyone is a different kind of community than a place, you know, where they're speaking into a megaphone. There's no better or worse, but there's, those are just different. Um, so virtual opportunities, where we are now. So there are kind of different ways to connect virtually. So the first is college sponsored. Um, most colleges at this point are doing these kinds of things. So information sessions often with I know at Muhlenberg and at Denison, um, one of us and a current student, so you get kind of both of those experiences. Interviews, a lot of schools that offer interviews, which is not every school, um, are doing a lot of virtual interviews. And that's a really great way, one, for the school to evaluate your student and get to know them a little bit better, but also for your student to get questions answered in a one-on-one -on -one, um, environment. So I wouldn't suggest that you are in the room when your student does the interview. Um, it's obvious when that happens and I think can sometimes create a little bit of a stressful situation for students, but you can always pass questions to your student before to get those answered as well. Um, as I said, a lot of schools are doing tours. So some are doing kind of like live tours with people. Others have kind of prefabbed virtual tours. Um, but that's another great way. And then a lot of schools are doing similar to what we're doing today, kind of departmental or larger offerings. So this isn't about Denison, but I know that Denison, for example, will be doing webinars kind of as we get more into our traditional fall recruitment. What is traditional? I don't know. Um, <laughs> like we'll be doing more like here's a humanities panel. Here's a student, a young alumni panel. Um, so those are really, really great ways. Also, um, most of these are recorded or might be recorded on websites. So if you can't see them, you can go and watch them later. So those are the college sponsored things. And the other great thing is you can attend one of those with or without your student, right? Um, you know, sometimes students are just not interested in going to a college, but you think they might, you know, want to learn more. So you can just learn more on your own here because schools are offering it for parents too. Um, 
So your school or district sponsored events are also really great. So whether it's a college fair, all of this will likely be virtual still or um, visits like Beckett and I used to go to high schools and talk to students and counselors. Uh, I hope one day we will again, but we'll still be doing that virtually kind of depending on your school. Um, and the bullet point that I clearly forgot is your counselors and your school resources um, are really amazing. So if you have access to a counselor, um, he or she can probably help provide you with kind of a big picture of what a lot of schools are offering. Because just like you got an email, well, there are some counselors on here actually. So just like all of you got an email about this webinar, counselors are getting emails about them too. And they are often very organized and willing to share their information with their students and their students' parents. Um, and then lastly, just connecting with admission representatives. So that would be like me or Becca or our counterparts again, because we are really here for you and your student. And we are here to be advocates for your families. We're here to be resources for your families. Um, as Becca said, she doesn't know the future, nor do I. If I did, I would be the wealthiest woman alive um, <laughs> with regards to what's going on. But we're here to help you and we know how to find resources that are sometimes a little bit harder to find on websites. So if you really need a contact, just reach out to one of us and you can always just find out who the ethereal we are by honestly just Googling like school name, admission staff, and then they often break it down by your region. Um, so that's a little bit about getting to know schools, which will ultimately help you build a list. Yeah, and I just want to reemphasize yeah. that, you know, what Caitlin said about the amazing virtual opportunities that are available. You know, we as admission professionals had to pivot. Um, that's like, you know, the, the COVID buzzword, right? Um, you know, very quickly um, when we, you know, had when the stay at home orders were put in place and we said, how can we bring our college experience to students in a virtual setting? Um, and I think, you know, while certainly none of us, I wish that we weren't experiencing what we're experiencing, I think what it has allowed us to realize is that even once our campuses are reopened, and once things feel, you know, I, I hate to say back to normal, because what, what is that, right? But we're going to continue to offer these virtual programs in some capacity, because now we have the infrastructure built, and we have the capacity to do, you know, to, we, we all know Zoom very well now at this point, right? So, um, you know, if you have a younger child who might be considering colleges that are further from home, before you start booking those, you know, big trips, you can start by doing these virtual info sessions, and then maybe narrow down the list from there. So, you know, I, again, I can't predict the future, but I know we've had conversations in our office about, you know, even once we're back open to tours, and that, you know, we can have visitors, um, what elements that we've created in in this virtual space will we continue to um, to practice because we know how how beneficial it can be for certain populations of students and families um, so now we're going to talk a bit about the application and decision process and so you know this is you know when i have conversations with parents and especially when i was on the high school side i would often hear them use the term we we're applying to college right and so i you know and i in in many ways appreciated the support i you know it was great to see parents so um excited and perhaps just as stressed about the process as their child but the reality is that your your child your student should be at the forefront of this process they are in the driver's seat they're the ones that should be keeping track of deadlines, who should be making the, the phone calls, um, who should really know, you know, you know, the ins and outs of these schools. And certainly as, as parents, as guardians, as counselors, you're supporting them. You're doing a lot to really, um, you know, guide them through this process that can feel really stressful. It can feel immensely vulnerable for students who have not, never had to kind of confront that vulnerability with total strangers before. And so there, you know, there, there's lots of ways to support your student, but it's, it's also really important to create boundaries, right? So, um, you know, when I, my, my previous job in admissions at a different institution, um, you know, we had very strict rules for when students were checking their application status, you know, they just wanted to make sure that we had received all of their materials and we would only give that information to the applicant. And so sometimes I would have a parent call on behalf of their child. I would explain the policy. They'd say, okay, thank you. I'll have my child's call. They'd hang up the phone. They'd call back 
pretending to be their child. And it was very clear that I was not speaking with a 17 year old high school student, right? Because as we know, our students don't feel comfortable talking on the phone anymore. Like they, they are used to FaceTiming and texting and Snapchatting one another, but actually picking up the phone and, and dialing it um, is not something they're used to, right? So, so create those boundaries, right? Make sure that your student is really the, the guiding force um, you know, behind this. And certainly if you as a parent have questions, you can call the admission office, you can reach out to the admission officer, but you want to create that balance. You don't want to be that parent in, you know, in our office that's always picking up the phone and calling or sending dozens of emails. You know, you really want your child um, to drive this process. And what I always say to families is that that this is an important transition, right? Because your child is going off to college, they are transitioning into a new um, area of adulthood where they'll likely be living independently. And so by really putting them in the driver's seat and having them be at the forefront of this process, you're just kind of helping create what um, that, that you know, intense adjustment of being an empty nester or having a child away at college is going to feel like. And so, um, so this is kind of the, the first step in that separation, so to speak, which I know there are probably parents in the, the webinar space right now that are like, oh my gosh, why did you say that, Becca? But I think it's important to, you know, to not feel like it's all coming in a wave at once the, the minute you drop your child off at college in August, but that you've, you've started, you know, kind of help, you know, encouraging them to really be um, independent and, and taking charge of this process. As a family, a great thing that you can do is, um, you know, brainstorming and editing the essay. But again, this is within reason. Um, you know, we can tell very easily when an essay has been over edited or when the vocabulary used is not, um, you know, in line with the rest of the student's application, right? So, you know, I think essay brainstorming, like thinking about topics is really great because who knows um, your child more than you, right? So they might, you might have a story of something that happened, you know, five years ago that, that, that your child forgot about and they're trying to write an essay about a particular thing. And so helping them brainstorm in that way is really great. Giving them verbal feedback once they've written their essay um, can be really helpful, but I always tell families to kind of steer clear of the red pen and the, the scribbling and slashing all over the essay. Because again, the, the essay is really a space for students to be vulnerable, to share something with colleges that um, we're not going to learn from other elements of their application. And so, um, you know, you all, you're all living with teenagers right now. You know how temperamental that experience can be. And so you want to tread lightly because they may have worked really hard on something. They may be really proud of it. Um, they may have opened up in a way that they haven't opened up to you in the essay. And so, you know, when you're giving that feedback, you want to make sure that, you know, you're, you're starting with the positives and then maybe offering some constructive feedback, but not in a way that is overpowering students um, and really, you know, it just discouraging them from coming to you for help. Um, you know, Caitlin and I both live in Los Angeles. It, you know, pre-COVID times, we spent a lot of time in our cars driving. That's the reality of living in Southern California. There's lots of traffic. We're on the road. Um, and so I always tell families to keep the car a college-free zone, right? Because, you know, the last thing that your child wants when they're sitting in traffic on the 405 is to just be, you know, um, just hit with a million questions about the college process. So I think it's important as a family to maybe create a boundary of saying, okay, we're going to talk about the college process on Sundays after dinner, or we're going to, you know, carve out this time, um, you know, within our, our week to talk about it. So it doesn't feel like something that is you know, coming at the students at every moment of every day, because even if they're not talking to you about it, they're probably thinking about it. And it's really easy for the stress that you're feeling or the anxiety that you're feeling about the college process to then um, kind of be internalized by your child, right? Again, I'm not a psychologist. I don't have any formal training here, but after, you know, a decade of this work, I can see very clearly when that, you know, as a parent stress about the processes is, is, you know, kind of transferring over to their child. So, create those boundaries, create those expectations. Um, and then, you know, come late March, early April, once all of those decisions have rolled in, this is a really celebratory moment. Um, you know, all of your child's hard, hard work has paid off. They've been admitted to, you know, hopefully multiple colleges, and then they get to make the decision. This is a part of the process that students really don't anticipate, right? So much of the college process feels beyond their control. And then once they get those offers of admission, they forget that, you know, the ball's in their court, so to speak, right? They ultimately get to make the choice of what school they attend. And so 
going back to those schools and touring again or, or you know, attending a virtual info session or, or you know, connecting that student with a, a current student. Those are all, you know, important conversations to have um, with your child. And, you know, again, I think it's really easy if you have an opinion about a particular school to let that rub off on, on your kid, right? So I remember this even through my own college tour process. My dad and I drove a couple of hours from home. We, we toured a school. He was like 100% into it and I was not feeling it. And so the whole drive home, he's like, I really think you should, I really think you should put it on your list. I was like, dad, I'm telling you right now, this school is not the right fit for me. Like I didn't it just, it's not right for me. Um, and similarly, there was a school I was really excited about where he was kind of hypercritical of the school, right? So again, you know, even if it's just a, like, oh, that building isn't that good looking or, or what, what have you, your kids can really internalize that sometimes. So you just wanna be careful about the commentary that you're making um, because ultimately you really want this to be a choice that your, your child is excited about. Um, so, so yeah, so you, you know, they'll be admitted, you'll, you'll tour schools and that's where, you know, as Caitlin mentioned, you can have the conversation about, okay, let's look at these financial aid packages. Let's look at the scholarships. Let's look at the numbers. Um, because, you know, it would be amazing if every student, you know, in the U S could just make a decision based on where they want to go and not have to factor finances into it. But the reality is that the cost of higher education is a big investment for students and for their families. And so you want to set those expectations, you know, go back to those early expectations that you set and then say and revisit them and say, okay, well, of the places you've been admitted to, this is what we feel comfortable affording. Or can we go back to the financial aid office and see if they can offer us maybe, you know, a little bit more scholarship because then we can make it work as a family. Um, so those are important conversations to have as well. Again, I feel like we're like distilling this really complex process into just a couple of slides. Caitlin and I could talk about this, but we could have like a, a monthly or weekly series for like three months and still not cover it all. But hopefully this is some kind of helpful overview of, you know, things to keep in mind as you are, you know, working with your child in this process. Yeah, I think that was great. I, I think my one thing to add, which is kind of like Becca's last bullet point about financial aid. Um, while I think that 100% students should be at the forefront of the admission process, if you find yourself having a lot of questions kind of in the pre-application process or pre-decision process about financial aid, that is a place where no office is going to say, oh, that parent who called financial aid, because we understand this is a, a big thing to think about and it's quite complicated. Um, so financial aid is definitely something that as a parent or a guardian, like full force, if your child is a little bit too overwhelmed to talk about that, um, I think that's a place where you can really be helpful in contacting the offices of admission or the offices of financial aid, kind of wherever those sit at a certain school. Um, yes, uh, that I think was my last thought on that. Um, so now we're going to talk about our all of our favorite topic, um, COVID-19 within admission. So I'm gonna actually let Becca cover this first bullet point, if you wouldn't mind, Becca, and then we'll just hit the rest of it together. Yeah, of course, Caitlin, thanks. So, um, you know, I think one thing that we, I, I think a common misconception about the world of college admissions is that we're these like terribly mean people who have these like red deny stamps that we love to just like put all over. Well, first of all, we don't read paper files, right? So that, that idea <laughs> of us sitting at like a desk with stacks of, of applications is a thing of the past. Um, my, I've worked in this industry for 10 years and we've always read digitally. So I certainly hear from colleagues who have, have lived in the paper application world before, but by and large, most of us are reading um, applications online. But anyways, I think that, you know, students are often, especially before they get to know us, um, you know, you know, there's this intimidation factor of like, oh, these people are deciding my future. And like they, you know, I think they think of us as these terrible people who want to deny students. But what I always remind students is we are admission counselors at the end of the day. We are looking for reasons to admit students to our school. Um, we're not looking for reasons to deny them, right? And, you know, while I've worked at various institutions with different ranges of select Activity. Um, the work doesn't get any easier if you work at a more selective place or a less selective place, right? Like you're still 
um, you know, reading each and every application, determining if a student is the right academic, personal fit um, for the institution. But as we've seen, you know, over the years, this process, which was, you know, not always as stressful as it is, has just become this kind of national conversation about, you know, selective college admission and how stressful it is and how, you know, students are applying to more and more colleges. And so, um, you know, there are a lot of really great articles and resources for, you know, ways to approach this process um, in a healthy way. And so um, we, both of our deans at Denison and at Muhlenberg, and I think over, it's like 300 college admission yeah. deans at this point, have signed um, uh, Care Counts in Crisis. Um, and it's, you know, it's really about, you know, putting the student at the forefront of this and, and prioritizing self-care in this process over, you know, being super stressed about the college process, which I know is easier said than done, right? Um, there's always going to be a level of stress with the process. I'll pop the link to, um, to this statement into the chat. So if you want to look at it, you're certainly welcome to do so. But know that, um, we as admission professionals, you know, all of the colleges that have signed on to this are recognizing that we are living in extraordinary times and that, you know, the priority for many of our students right now isn't, you know, getting the, the best SAT score because the reality is that where can you take the SAT right now, right? <laughs> like got access to the test is challenging enough and that, you know, we just want students to um, you know, we're not mad if you can't finish your Eagle Scout project because of COVID or if the fundraiser that you were planning um, for your extracurricular, is, you know, was canceled because of COVID, right? We love to yeah. see that you're finding meaningful ways to spend your time, right? And for some students, that might mean learning how to play the ukulele via YouTube because they have some additional time and they're not leaving their house. Or maybe it's volunteering at a local food bank, um, you know, as, as safely as you can, right? So we're not expecting students to, you know, pick up a million different extracurricular activities and we're not penalizing them for, you know, the challenges that they're facing right now. The same way that, um, you know, we understand that digital learning, online learning is very different from what our students are used to. And so if we see a dip in grades or, you know, a change in, you know, course work or anything like that, um, you know, it's not going to be the nail in the coffin for a student in the admission process, right? We, um, you know, read holistically, we really get to know our students. And so we're going to be forgiving as we look at our rising seniors and our rising juniors, um, because we know that they are not having the experience that they had expected. You know, there's no senior prom, there's no homecoming, like all of these rites of passage and these exciting things that they've looked forward to for a long time aren't going to happen. And so, um, you know, we, we want to take that context into, into consideration when we're evaluating their application. So, I, you know, I know it's just a statement, but I want to tell you, you know, I feel really grateful to work at a place that, that cares so deeply about its students that we really just want them to get through the next couple of, you know, stressful months um, however best they can and not feel the pressure to, you know, outperform all of their extracurricular activities and all of that. So Caitlin, I don't know if you want to add anything. I feel like I'm just rambling now. But Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I agree with everything Becca said. And I think that it's just really easy. I've done a lot of webinars. I've spoken to a lot of families. Um, and I think it's really easy to think about how COVID is impacting us as an individual family or my student um, or you know my daughter my son and just really remembering putting it in perspective that every student applying to college next year is in the same boat and we all know that and i think becca really hit the nail on the coffin in terms of extracurriculars i also just want to say academics um, are the same so we know that some schools you had to take classes pass fail in your second semester of junior year, right? For, for rising or sophomores or whatever year you're in, the spring you had to take pass fail. Or maybe you couldn't take pass fail. And as Becca said, because digital learning is different, your grades dipped a little. That's okay. Um, all of us, you know, while I don't think Becca could say what they're going to do, and I can't tell you for sure what we're gonna do in committee, when we're going through the application process, I know we will not be penalizing students for either decision because this was completely out of their hands. Um, so I think that's really important to remember and to just try and stress a little less about that. I know it's very stressful. Um, also kind of knowing that on the common application and the coalition application actually, I believe, 
Um, there is going to be a separate question about how COVID has impacted your student or your family. So a lot of students, um, honestly, as soon as this happened, I had a couple of juniors call me asking about what they should write their essay about and should they write it about COVID. And this is like, you know, March 25th. So this was the very beginning anyway. Um, but I, you know, I think the answer is you don't have to. It's okay. If you want to talk about how your family or how your student was impacted, maybe that Eagle Scout project that didn't get finished. There is going to be a place on the application for your student to do that. Um, and I think that, you know, that's just going to help a lot of families. And it will help us as well because it can help, again, contextualize your students, not just your application, but just the whole thing, especially at schools like Muhlenberg and Denison and many of our peers that read holistically, we really are looking at the entire student. Um, so the student within the context of their school, within the context of their larger environment, and within the context of this global pandemic at a certain point, right? Um, so again, as Becca said, we are admission officers. We are here to help. Um, you know, another resource that I didn't really talk about, um, just as it relates to the admission, kind of the application, a lot of schools are doing like application workshops, um, whether it's a mock admission committee or, you know, essay kind of essay guidelines. I know we're doing that at Denison kind of um, like the extracurriculars or demonstrated interests. Um, so you can really like get pretty deep into topics that a lot of people on our side of the desk weren't talking about before this, kind of keeping a lot of people kept a lot of this in the lockbox. It's now creeping out, um, which is great for you. So um, the next, whoop, the next slide, this is just our contact information in case you want to follow up with us, ask us any questions. We have about 10 more minutes um, to do Q&A. Becca's gonna kind of lead that, um, but we're gonna try and answer your questions as best as possible. Awesome, thanks so much, Caitlin. So we've had some yeah. wonderful questions come in. So, you know, feel free to pop additional questions and a lot of them have been similar. So it's clear that y'all are on the same wavelength. <laughs> um, so we've had a few questions about test optional admission. So I'm gonna read one of them and then Caitlin and I will just kind of elaborate on, um, on test optional admission in general. So um, yeah. the question is because schools are test optional this year, is there any benefit to turning in scores? What would be a good reason to submit the scores? What is a good reason to not turn in the scores? if you have them. Um, so I actually gave a presentation on test optional admission this morning to a high school um, up in the Bay Area. And we had a really productive conversation about the history of test optional admission um, and you know, kind of where test optional is right now. So um, Muhlenberg has been test optional since 1998. So this is nothing new for us. Caitlin, what about Denison? Um, I think we've been test optional for 13 years, maybe Great. 12. So, yeah. so Test optional is not a result of COVID for either of us. Yeah. So, but what I'll tell you, um, you know, as it relates to test optional admission is that there, you know, when, when some of the schools who were early adopters of test optional implemented that policy, they did a ton of research to see kind of, you know, it, of the students who apply test optional, you know, compared to their peers who did submit scores, what, um, what does their academic performance look like? What does their graduation rate look like? And so um, the reality is that graduation rates are the same for submitters versus non-submitters and our non-submitters students often outperform their submitter peers um, when it comes to their average GPA by the time that they graduate. So, you know, that's a really clear indication that, you know, you are so much more than your test scores, right? As someone who d did not identify as a great test taker, that was just not something that I was great at. Um, you know, it, that was really great to hear. But when I was applying to college, um, test optional wasn't as much of a thing as it is now. This year in particular, you know, over 200 schools have announced that they're going test optional for at least this next year um, you know because we're based in California we you know hear a lot about the UC system and when they decided to go test optional I think that was a really big statement to um, you know colleges around the the, the US and, and the world to some extent that you know if a school that receives 113,000 applications for first year admission can you know commit to a test optional policy then that's something that um, that we can do as well. And so, you know, it's for some schools, it's going to shift their admission process a little bit because 
they, you know, maybe they relied a little bit more on those quantitative elements of the application in order to admit a student. So they're going to have to shift to a more holistic review. But by and large, a lot of these schools are already reviewing applications holistically. So if a student does not submit scores, we're not assuming that the scores that they're not submitting are bad, um, you know, by, <laughs> by, you know, any stretch of the imagination, right, that, you know, I often get that question from students who are like, oh, you're test optional, but I should submit my scores, right? And the reality is no, if, if you don't think your scores are representative of who you are as a student um, and you think that your GPA and the rigor of your curriculum and your extracurricular involvement, it, you know, is more indicative of, of that, of who you are and how you would succeed on our campus, then let that speak for itself. Um, we also know that students have a tough time finding access to these tests. Um, we are not, there is no expectation that you are driving hundreds of miles away to go and take that test or, you know, jumping through hoops, um, you know, to, to find a test. We, you know, we, we get it and we want you to be safe and responsible. Um, and for those of you who took the test or for, you know, if your children took the test, um, you know, pre-COVID, you know, that's a, an early timeline for, for standardized yeah. testing, right? The average timeline is, you know, you test in the spring of your junior year and then again in the fall of your senior year. And oftentimes you see a really big spike, not, not huge, but you see an yeah. improvement <laughs> from the spring of junior year to the fall of senior year, not because they spent the whole summer in a test prep boot camp or anything like that, but often because um, the knowledge that they've gained through what they've been reading, through you know, just their overall learning and growth and development is going to show an improvement in those scores. And so there are students out there who have scores which is great, but they're not happy with, you know, what, what those scores represent. So this, this is a great year to say, you know what, I'm just not going to submit those scores. If you feel like you're on the bubble, have a conversation with your counselor or have a conversation with the school. We're really transparent with students if they yeah. say, you know, this is my SAT score, should I submit it? And I'll say, you know what, yes, absolutely you should, or I don't think that that's going to, to add anything to your application. So let's let the rest of it speak for itself. So again, every school is going to be different. The best resource for this is fairtest.org. Um, they have, you know, a running list that's updated like every minute. I bet in the time we've been in this webinar, another school has announced <laughs> that they are going test optional for next year. So, um, you know, and my hope, again, I can't predict the future, but my hope is that, you know, that for the schools that had to go test optional this year due to, to testing limitations, that they will see what value test optional students are bringing to their campus yeah. and that, you know, the emphasis on standardized testing that has always been a driving factor in the college process will just, it'll still be a factor in some ways, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that it will, um, you know, kind of yeah. dissipate a little bit. So, um, awesome. All right. So Caitlin, I'll have you mm -hmm. um, answer this question. Um, the yeah. question is, if a student is interested in playing varsity athletics, what's the sequence of that process? Do coaches only want to talk to students once they've been admitted? Or does the coach's interest in the student help the student when being admitted? Or maybe it yeah. depends. That is a great question. And I'm just going to put a plug for my other webinar in, my, in the series that I'm doing. is <laughs> athletics and admission at Division three institutions. I think it's next week. Maybe it's in two weeks. I don't know. Um, so the, the answer is it really depends. Um, my knowledge that I have, um, I'm the athletics liaison at Denison, and I've done that job at another school as well. So my knowledge and kind of expertise really lies within the Division Three realm. So everything that I say is Division Three. You can ignore the Division One and Two, which are just entirely other playing fields. <laughs> um, so I would say if you know that you're interested, you should contact the coach. Um, how do you find that contact information? Google the sport and the school, um, and you can find the, the coach's information. There are typically recruit questionnaires as well um, that I would highly encourage your student to fill out um, because that can also kind of be the starting point. So, you know, some sports are done recruiting by the end of early decision. So, you know, if you're not applying early decision to a specific school at a specific sport, likely not going to be on the team. Some school, um, some coaches or some sports, you know, it depends on the school also, obviously, um, recruit all the way through regular decision. Um, and so you have a lot more flexibility. Some sports, walk-ons will happen. So you don't even have to have been in contact with the coach throughout the admission process. Others, walk-ons just aren't going to happen because they have such a strong program. Um, that they don't need walk-ons. Um, but I would say that even within the D3 context, so there is no scholarship, there's no athletic scholarship um, granting at Division three schools. 
But depending on the institution, the coach could still have some pull. Um, so many schools have kind of a, an early application kind of pre-read evaluation, not all schools. So if you ask a, an admission counselor or a coach about that and they say, we don't do that, that's very legit. Um, but many schools, especially ones with maybe more competitive athletic processes, do kind of a pre-read just to see how, how academically competitive are you because that helps the coach understand should he or she still um, recruit you. And also it gives you an indication of how recruitable or how admissible you are. So the answer, it just really depends. Pre-application is great. Post-application is great. Um, yeah, and I think it's really school specific. So I would really encourage you to get in contact with coaches soon. If you can't find that information, just reach out again to like the us's of your school. Awesome. So we've had a few questions come in about um, whether or not test scores are tied to merit-based scholarships. And so one um, answer you're often going to get in the college process is that it depends, right? And I, I hate saying this, but the reality is that every school is different in terms of their requirements and, and their expectations. Um, when we, you know, we've been test optional for a long time. We changed our test optional policy, um, you know, a couple of years ago to not no longer factor standardized testing into our merit-based scholarships because we said if we're committing to being a test optional place, we don't want to prevent students who are otherwise super academically qualified from receiving those scholarships. But that is a great question to ask of the schools that are on your list. Even if in years past scholarships have been tied to test scores, I imagine that this year um, with the limitations related to testing, um, they won't be able to give out all of the scholarship money that they have for students who are submitting scores because there's, you know, a, a large majority of students are going to be submitting um, though or not submitting standardized test scores um we probably have time for maybe one more question and you know there have been a ton of great questions coming in so if we haven't answered your question and you want to continue the conversation please don't hesitate to email either myself or caitlin or both of us and we're more than happy to you know have this conversation over email um, so this question is about um, essays in the application process so the question is does each college give a different prompt for the essay in the common app. Um, Caitlin, can you talk a little bit about kind of the different writing requirements that colleges have? Yes, um, I will also say that I will get um, a list of the questions after this and also Becca and I can try to reach out with your answers as well. Um, but if you have more, of course, contact us. Um, so the essay, so the common app, this is only for schools on the common app. There is one general essay that your student will write. There are a number of different prompts that they can choose from. Um, and that one kind of general personal essay will go to all schools that are on the common app. So it will go to me, it will go to Becca, wherever else you apply. So that's the one that will go everywhere. Then some schools have supplements. So it might be a very common one is like, why Denison or some some range from that to like fill out this you know fill out the sentence with one word my best friend is this I want to have dinner with this person um, and those are school specific and will only go to the school that is asking you those questions or asking your students those questions so the big essay will come to all of us the little supplements um, will just go to specific schools and don't freak out if your students like you know, I, my school doesn't have any supplements. Like that's, that's also true. A lot of schools don't have supplements. Um, so really, you know, that's why the essay is important in that. Um, I think that's the last question, right, Becca? Yeah, there, there's yeah. more, but unfortunately we want you to go yeah. and eat dinner and enjoy time <laughs> with your family. So, so we'll try to get to these questions um, after the fact, but we just wanna thank you so much for joining us. Um, you know, of course we wish we could be doing this in person, but you know, the geographic range or reach that we have <laughs> in this webinar space is much greater than, than if we were um, on campus. So thank you so much. We wish you the best of luck um, to both you and to your child. Um, and if there's anything we can do to help you with this process, please don't hesitate to reach out. Yes, yeah. thanks so much, everyone. Have a great evening. Bye. Bye.